Ja, herzlich willkommen. Guten Tag, nehmen Sie Platz. Welcome, please have a seat. Schön, dass so viele hier an diesem I'm pleased that so many of you have come here on this hot September day. Welcome to the presentation of the new report uh, to the Club of Rome entitled 1% is enough. Uh, solutions for a sustainable future. I would also like to welcome all those listening to the live stream and you will be able to ask questions later on. First of all, I will give you a few figures. About two million children live in poverty. More than four million young people below the age of 25 are unemployed and every fifth pensioner is not able to live off his pension. Those are no figures from development countries, but those are numbers from EU countries and industrialized countries here in Europe. Europe. So the gap between poor and rich is increasing and the impacts of climate change become ever more visible and they are threatening our existence and we have uh, 65 uh, million people uh, fleeing from poverty, from uh, environmental destructions and of wars. So the list of challenges is endless. Now, our economic uh, activity, how long will it be able to survive? What will be the measures for the future? What is the way into the future? What uh, measures will have to be taken? Our two authors have dealt with these questions and they will present their solutions later on. Before they uh, will um, do this, we have another um, guest with us, the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation, who also has an endless list of challenges he has to cope with on his desk uh, day in, day out. He's responsible for seeing to a more sustainable and just world. And he's also responsible for implementing the ideas directed towards this. Maybe uh, he will um, give us uh, the solution and uh, tell us whether he will get a copy of the book later on. I welcome the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation. Thank you very much. Guess, uh, Members of the Club of Rome, it's a great pleasure for me today to welcome you here today, Mr. Weikmann, and of course the two authors uh, of the report, Mr. Renders, Mr. Maxton, a warm welcome to you. We will be engaging in a cooperation uh, project, not just today, but also on Wednesday and Thursday, on a conference uh, on the future, so we'll continue our cooperation there. And uh, I was very shocked when I heard the figures just now. I mean, it's terrible for Germany, two million children living in poverty, but I can tell you that 250 million around the world below the poverty line, just in India, in India alone, with, uh, well, in a country that has the highest proportion of billionaires, which brings us right to our topic today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Club of Rome has always been ahead of the times, and I'm very pleased that you're building on your previous insights and reports as a young man, a politician who took an interest in such issues, well, I read your report with great interest. And when we look back on these times, well, let's take the year 1960. Since 1960, well, we'll be talking about uh, the level of growth that is necessary or possible. Since 1960, world economic growth has increased sevenfold. CO2 emissions have increased fourfold and the global population has almost doubled, which is why I'm very grateful to you that uh, building on your findings at the time on the report on the state of humanity, you have launched a new report. We're living in a global village today. That's truer than ever before. And you are sending out a very clear and strong message because globally speaking, we are at a crossroads, a crossroads for the planet. This morning, when I left home, I saw the Alps, the mountains, um, 
They've been there for millions of years, and uh, it is said that this planet was the third uh, in the solar system. It is four billion years old, so scientists say. And human creatures came about four million years ago. And then migration started, a migration away from Africa to Europe many thousands of years ago. And today, we are a part of Africa. We are a piece of Africa. We here in Berlin. So that's what I wanted to say about living together on this planet. I mean, there was life on this planet of millions and billions of years before humankind came into existence. And my thesis, my assumption is that there will also be life after humankind and for billions of years as well. The question is of whether there can be a future of this planet with humankind in a good balance with nature. And that's why I'm talking about a crossroads. Or are we pushing the planet to the brink of a collapse? That's the key question. And we have a unique opportunity. Our task, our challenge of policy policymakers, of society, of people in uh, the industry, in academia, etc., have to develop new ideas for shaping globalization equitably and in a sustainable way, in harmony with nature. The challenges are tremendous. I just raised the issue of population growth. As I said, since 1955, we've had a plus of eight, 80 million people every year, and special challenges on the African continent. Since, until 2050, two billion babies will be born on this continent. And your thesis will be that we need less growth, but let me put it differently. I think we need a different type of growth. We do need growth, but we need a new kind of growth. The population development, population growth, uh, human beings taking possession of this planet needs to scarcity of resources. It needs to a uh, competition for resources. There will be wars for water in the future if we don't manage to solve this uh, problem, to take up this challenge and to use water in a sustainable way. So how can we satisfy the hunger for energy? That's another question. Today, in China, 180 coal-fired power plants are built. And last week, I used our veto to guarantee a, well, to stop the construction of a lignite-fired power plant in Kosovo. Well, this cannot be the future if we try to satisfy the world's energy for HANA and the world of, on the basis of lignite or hard coal in Kosovo or in our region, that we will not be able to tackle the challenges of the future with regard to climate change and we'll see dramatic consequences for millions and millions of people around the globe. And I'm very grateful to the Club of Rome. I'm very pleased that we have this very fruitful cooperation with the Club of Rome. It's not Club of Rome. It's not enough to just to describe or explain problems, show pictures, uh, shocking pictures. It's important to develop solutions, to outline solutions. And we as policymakers are on a good track. We're developing solutions, we're sharing solutions, solutions for tackling and mastering these tremendous challenges. Last year, we agreed on the 17 SDGs, a pact on the world's future. And we also have the Paris, Paris Agreement on climate change. And I think this is a true breakthrough. Last week, China and the US and, the Brazil, and Brazil have ratified it. And we know what to do. We as policymakers know what to do globally. And business makers know what to do. We know how to shape the future in order to make sure that we don't um, see a collapse of the world, but that we 
make sure that future generations can live on this planet. But we need to take action. We need to implement the agreements. We need to walk our talk, as it were. And we do have solutions. We need a shift in paradigm in global economic activity, in global uh, consumption patterns are needed. We do have a problem of injustice that we're also reading about in your report. Rich people here in Berlin, in industrialized countries, account for 20% of the global population, but we are using 80% of the world's natural resources for our prosperity, for our consumption, for our lifestyles. And we leave the others behind. Poverty, hunger, deprivation. And this, of course, leads to unrest, it leads to wars, it leads to conflict, which is why this gap must become smaller. We have to create justice. So the question is how to shape growth in a way that we achieve uh, good uh, coexistence, peaceful coexistence and harmony between the different countries, industrialized, developing countries, and emerging economies. So the gap must not widen further. We must well, make it smaller, and we do bear a lot of responsibility in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, growth in the Western part of the world Economic models, consumptions model, consumption models, and that's also something that you uh, raise in your issue, in your, in your report. This is something that we don't only have to, well, take a look at. We have to develop solutions. And you draw conclusions that were also mentioned in the report published by the study commission of the German Bundestag, the German parliament. This report may be somewhere in the library, but it's important to act on these recommendations. The Western economic and consumption model, our cars, our lifestyle, Nespresso, our hunger for energy, but 10 tons of carbon dioxide per capita compared to 0.8 in Bangladesh or India. Our economic and consumption model is not a model that can be fit for the future, neither in India or in Africa, which is why we have to come up with new answers, new approaches. We need to use our resources more efficiently. Professor Weizsäcker, who cannot be with us today, unfortunately, but uh, he gave a very insightful, interesting interview, his assumption of factor 5 or factor 10. So use less resources, use less energy, but increase production. It is possible. In Germany, we've implemented this strategy of decoupling very successfully. I think Germany or Europe is a region of excellency. Yes, we are a region of excellency. We do have a lot of innovation. We do have new technologies for us to solve these problems. We can overcome hunger in the world. The planet does have the resources, enough resources for at least 10 billion people. It's all a matter of how we use our technologies, how we use our knowledge, and also of how we let the poor participate in purchasing power instead of exploiting them. It's all about fairness. It's all about fair trade systems as well. So we need a decoupling, well, twice. Today is the 9th of September. Sorry, the 13th of December. And we are obliged to the planet. We have a responsibility to the planet. Whatever we've consumed or used in terms of energy since the middle of August cannot be regenerated by the planet. So the way that we live today, we would need one and a half times the planet. And if we then transfer this to 7.5 billion people, we would need three times the planet, which is why we need to have a double decoupling. 
We do have the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, we do have the report, we do have uh, the Pact on the world's future, but now it's all about responsibility. It's about fair trade, and I think Germany is a region of excellency, and we have to pave the way, we have to be pioneers. I think many in developing countries place their trust in us. And I think when it comes to sustainability, we have read the sustainability report of the German government, and Ms. Hendricks will present the climate protection plan for Germany. And I think Lignite and other energy sources are still an important part of our energy system, but we need to achieve a turnaround also in the area of transportation. And urbanization is also another challenge that we need to take up. And at the Habitat Conference, we will be presenting a proposal in this context. So we need to develop new political approaches, and we need to introduce them to the public debate, we have to implement them, and together with the Club of Rome, we will, as of tomorrow, have an intensive debate with doers and thinkers and develop sustainable solutions in Munich. In cooperation with Deutsches Museum and the Club of Rome, we will have intensive discussions on how to shape the world in a sustainable and fair manner. 2030, 2050, we'll do simulations and then draw our conclusions. I very much look forward to our common event, and I'd like to invite you all very warmly to this event. You can join us either via live stream or on TV, but first of all, let me thank you for coming, and we very much look forward to your speech and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Would you just stay with us for a couple of minutes? Well, you raised uh, quite a few topics, uh, and I think you will be needing a lot of money to implement this. So you will be going to the federal parliament uh, to discuss this. Maybe we can have two questions for the minister. Just introduce yourselves briefly. Thank you for this refreshing uh, presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Andreas Klei. I work for a philosophical magazine. We started talking about money. We have heard this uh, figure, one uh, trillion uh, euros of tax will uh, are lost due to uh, competition for taxes. So what we've heard uh, or what we see in tax policies also uh, happens in other areas of policy. The uh, European countries compete with each other. Now, how will this solve anything at the end of the day? How will we um, shape a political world which will not uh, try to compete with others or look at the neighbors and say, well, let them go ahead, we'll uh, stay behind, or uh, Germany to say, well, we will go ahead and other was for others will follow suit. So where do we have this uh, Bismarck figure in Europe that will um, settle everything? Well, this is a global issue you're raising. This topic, financing, global financing, and uh, we need a global uh, just financing system for the world. And um, Finance Minister Schäuble will take part in our discussion of the future, or Futures uh, Forum. And uh, this will be the introduction. Federal Minister, Sch Finance Minister Schäuble already introduced ideas. There is, uh, money is available in the world. Uh, the question is of how we can get these financial streams between Shanghai and San Francisco and redirect them into sustainable development and structures. It is a very exciting topic, but if I would, uh, were to try and uh, elaborate, I think it would take hours. 
Are there any other questions? I have two questions. The first is how, what would you, will you do about uh, not letting the gap between rich and poor become even bigger? And uh, what will you do and, uh, so that India and Bangladesh will not follow suit with our consumption model? How will you get them to not follow suit? Well, the two authors presented uh, this the course of action which has to be followed. It uh, is true for politicians and uh, people in business. The gap is not only true for development countries, but uh, developing countries, but also for development countries. We here in Germany have the same problem, but we still are a model for other countries with respect to the gap that is, and with respect to uh, the um, middle classes. But poor and rich, I think there are three approaches in my policies. First of all, we have to launch these ideas that development cooperation needs to be raised, the efforts need to be raised uh, twofold. Secondly, we need investments uh, by industry in developing and emerging countries. I presented German proposals and introduced new uh, ways of going about this. And uh, third of all, we need a transformation from world trade to fair trade. We need to develop our uh, fair trade system further to allow uh, development in developing countries. For example, the uh, Pact of Tax Textiles Pact, was launched and C&A um, had uh, uh, produced a $5 garment which was sold for $100 here in Berlin. And the value chain, uh, other people need to participate in this value chain in a more just way. And this is true for all uh, value added chains, for Coltan and other um, elements used in mobile phones and this will create uh, activity in these countries and we all need a investment in the future and that is education. Education really is the key to solving all future problems. I'm pleased to answer your questions here. Thomas Nies, IAD Radio. Your ideas, which are known to us, what is the gap between your ministry and the ministries in Europe? Do you have to fight for your ideas and justify your ideas? Well, we agree, basically. Uh, from recognizing a problem to changing a mode of action, it takes time. Most of the time, it will be uh, initiated by a disaster or it will take 10 to 20 years for this transformation. You uh, know this yourselves. Um, you will step on the scales in the morning and you say, well, I'm 20 pound overweight. I really have to do something about this. And years go by, you don't do anything. And then you have diabetes or a heart attack, and then you start doing something. Because the disaster struck and uh, the doctor told you, uh, if you continue along these lines, you can order um, uh, your funeral. I have come back from the uh, Council of Development Ministers. There are different uh, opinions there, but to transform and to implement the strategies is a difficult path to follow. If 
You look at the results of MAO last year and what uh, the Chancellor put down, that is a CO2-free uh, century. Uh, it was inconceivable that there would be a consensus on this. Uh, what was ratified by the United States last year is a blessing, and fortunately Obama made this happen. Five years ago, this was inconceivable. So we've set the framework, the SDGs, we have uh, the Pact on the World's Future, we have Paris, and now it's um, for society to take action. Society journalists have to uh, take actions, and this is why I'm grateful to the Club of Rome because they provide us with the basis, the scientific knowledge, and they give us a plan of how to implement all this, how to take action, and to support people like me. Thank you very much for this, because often you're isolated in today's world, but I'm not alone in this, and I'm pleased that uh, the uh, Chancellor will discuss these topics internationally and that we have a budget to implement our policies. Minister Müller, you have to leave. Do you have uh, time for another question, for one more question? How will you have a look at the SDGs together? Since the first uh, report of the Club of Rome, we know that we have to solve a dilemma. Wouldn't there be a competition and uh, that we can uh, set free win-win-win situations? and uh, take a holistic um, look at things and maybe not just um, support national uh, structures. I think uh, the two authors will give you an answer to this, so it's worthwhile to stay on and listen to them. Okay, that's what me it's leid. Vielleicht kann man es später noch mal. Sorry, maybe we can have another look at this later on. So this will be the major part now. That is the presentation of the book. One percent is enough. One percent is enough. That is a provocative title. So you came up with three, uh, 13 theses that you will be presenting to us. We have um, Graham Maxton. He has um, written a number of um, presentations. The uh, Growth Lie was one of his uh, books. And Jürgen Randa is in the Norwegian director of the Norwegian Business School. He worked for WWF as a president, and he is a co-author of Limits to Growth, which was published 1972, and which uh, was discussed very controversially over the years. So the presentation will be held in English, and uh, you will have a translation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have spent the last 45 years struggling to solve the problems so eloquently presented by Minister Müller. That is, to try to get in place global sustainability. It started, uh, as the moderator said, that my friends and I wrote the Limits to Growth book in 1972, 44 years ago, where we outlined the problem, namely that if you have physical growth on a finite planet, you will in the end get overshoot and collapse when you exceed the carrying capacity of the finite planet. We repeated this message in two other club uh, reports to the Club of Rome in 1992 and in the year 2004. In 2012, we were about to write the 40-year uh, memorial, so to speak, of the limits to growth, but didn't do that. Instead, I summed up my experience after having spent 40 years trying to do what 
Minister Müller is asking for. And I summarized that experience in a forecast, a prognosis of what will actually happen over the next 40 years. So I was trying to tell humanity what will be the sum of the decisions that individuals, corporations, nations, and the world is likely to make over the next 40 years. And the sad fact is that, as you know, the 2052 book says that the most likely development over the next 40 years is that we run into a climate crisis, that the temperature will exceed, that global warming will exceed plus two degrees centigrade in, in 2050, and then trigger a climate catastrophe in the second half of uh, the century. Uh, now, we are finally, Graham and I, at the point where we're going to present the solutions. Because, of course, during all these 44 years, we have been thinking about what to do. You know, what are the answers to Minister Müller's request, you know, for, for, for a more sustainable world? And we are very, very happy to have been able to complete this book in three years' time you know, and finally come up with the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about the storyline. Very simply, how we get to the position that we think we need to begin. Then Jürgen will present the 13 solutions, and then I'll say a little bit about some of the barriers that need to be overcome. We live in a world today where we want ever more. We want to consume more, we want more economic growth, we want more possessions, we want to grow more. But this is causing a number of problems. It's causing ecological problems. Here we are in Berlin today in the middle of September and it's 34 degrees. That's not normal. So we are causing ecological problems. And we're causing a number of social problems because we're living in overshoot. The minister talked about migration. That's one of the consequences of us living beyond our means. But two of the most important problems and the most urgent problems are unemployment and inequality. Inequality, as we know from uh, Pictet's book in France, has been growing steadily in the last 30 years. In fact, the gap between rich and poor, between the rich world and the poor world, is bigger today than it was in 1820. So more than 200 years of economic development has resulted in increase in inequality, not a reduction. For the last 30 years, we've had strong economic growth. We've had some of the fastest growth in human history. And yet these problems of inequality and unemployment have got worse. Now the economists, most of the economists have told us that the opposite should happen. That economic growth will solve the problems of unemployment and inequality and yet they've got worse. Now we face a period of robotization. There's a great wave of computerization, robotization, and technological development coming through in the next few years. And some of the forecasts suggest that we could lose millions of jobs in the rich world. And so we have a situation where unemployment is already extremely high, particularly in countries like Spain or Greece or Portugal, but even in countries like America and, and Germany, and yet now we're facing a, an increase in unemployment. So we seem to be at an economic dead end. The economic system is not addressing the fundamental problems that we face. And if we carry on without change, then inequality will increase, unemployment will increase, and also planetary destruction will increase. The reason we have this climate change is because we're demanding ever more growth. And so we have to push more and more resources through the system, which requires more and more energy, which creates the CO2, which is causing climate change. So the economic system, rather than being the solution to our problems, is the cause of our problems. We also have to find a way to fix the system 
at a time when the planet is going to be changing. Climate change is with us. It's already accelerating. We see the migrants from Syria. We see evidence in much of Africa already of climate change. And so we have to fix the, 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 the economic system at a time when we are also facing demands for, for response to climate change. But we still need to find a new approach. We need to find a different way. We need to find a way to move the economic system over 20 years, to shift it onto a more sustainable path. And that's what this book does. We are talking about how to shift the economic system without making things worse. How can we move the system from a, uh, one that is not sustainable to one that is sustainable? And that's what our 13 solutions are about. So let me hand back to Jürgen to talk about those. Uh, over the last 40 years, uh, I and a number of other well-meaning people have been proposing solutions to the sustainability problem again and again, and very little has happened. We think the reason why little happens is that most of the proposals involve a sacrifice for the general person in the short term. And consequently, you know, people would rather spend their own money, you know, increasing consumption and traveling to Spain rather than paying this money in order to solve the problem in the long run. So what we have done, we have tried to identify 13 actions that each have an advantage in the short term to a majority of the voters. So that our list is a list of politically feasible solutions as opposed to the dream list that normally is presented. And the, the, uh, I've grouped our 13 proposals under uh, three headings. And so the first slide simply lists what things we suggest should be done in order to try to make it cooler next time we have this press conference, namely to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And because the time is so short, I'm simply going to tell you what we propose. Some of these things are trivial to understand, others require a lot of thinking. Read the book or ask questions. The first thing we suggest to do in order to reduce greenhouse gases is to implement what is called green stimulus packages paid for by newly printed money. So this basically means that the state prints money and pays this to people to work to make a better world. The second proposal is to tax coal, oil and gas at source and take the money that you get and distribute it among all citizens in equal amounts. This will have the effect of making coal, oil and gas much more expensive, but at the same time, the poor people will get more money through the redistribution than their cost is. The third proposal is to pay workers well you know, when they are forced to move from dirty jobs to clean jobs. You know, the first thing that will happen in, in your country when you really start phasing out coal, oil and gas is, of course, that people use, lose jobs in coal, oil and gas. And you need to, the state needs to pay them while they are in transition, while they're being trained, and to get a job in the clean sector. The fourth proposal is to shift from taxes on income to taxes on resources. This is from labor to footprint. This is the green tax reform that has been spoken about for 20 years uh, and not gotten very far. The next question is an interesting one. It is to legislate more compulsory vacation. It is to ask the parliament to pass a law which says that the number of vacation days in Germany will increase by two every year from now on, without any change in the annual uh, salary. And the final question here, which is one which is really aimed at long-term cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, is to pay women who have one child or less when they pass 50 years of age. This is in order to put up an economic incentive for having fewer children, in addition to you know, all the incentives that currently exist for paying women to have children like in my country. 
The second uh, list is what we propose to do in order to reduce unemployment. And again, here pops up the green stimulus package. Namely, state paying formerly unemployed people to be trained and then work to clean the environment, to build, to insulate homes, to build sun and wind, etc. The second proposal is to pay people who take care of others at home. Currently, it's grossly unfair that if you work in a nursing home, you do, tending to old people, you do get paid by the, uh, your other citizens. But if you do the same thing alone at home, you don't get paid, and this needs to be changed. Uh, the third proposal was already mentioned by the minister. It is to restrict trade when this is needed to protect jobs. We know that this is going to lead to lower economic growth, but that means lower growth in the total GDP. You know, the distribution of that growth is what is important, and by restricting trade, you can actually get in a situation where the majority gets better off, while the elite, me and my friends, is actually paying the bill. And then, again, legislate more compulsory vacation is one way of rationing whatever paid work is available among uh, uh, fewer people. On the third uh, slide uh, are the actions in order to try to directly affect inequity. In other words, directly try to take from the rich and give to the majority. And here are, again, the same things. The, the tax on coal, oil, and gas certainly works to redistribute income. And the interesting thing about this uh, tax was that Iran actually chose to use this method four months ago when they canceled their huge subsidies to uh, petroleum for Iranians. Number two, increase the taxation of corporations and the rich. We have already been talking about the fact that one billion, uh, thousand billion euros are lost because, you know, the elite is very good at arguing in favor of equal treatment, you know, among competing nations and consequently are very good at lowering uh, the tax rate. The majority would have great benefit, you know, from turning that uh, tide. One needs to increase the inheritance tax. That's a cheap way of avoiding you know, inequities actually accumulating through generations. We need to increase the pension age because there will be many very old persons like me around that should not be sitting at home, but should rather be doing something constructive. And what they will be doing is, of course, not to work in the coal mines. They will be working in the sector where Germany and Norway and other countries need people, namely in care and hospitals. So this is basically asking the young old to watch, to care for the old old. And that system needs to be put in place. Uh, again, pay people to take care of others at home, uh, pops up on this list. And then finally, uh, we encourage unionization, that we would move society back into a situation that existed in North Europe in the past, where the majority is unionized, so that they have a stronger voice you know, in the negotiation about the sharing of the total pie. The second reason why unions are important is that they can constitute very useful political support for uh, ministers who really try to do something. Uh, finally, uh, but this is not, this is the 13th proposal. We are not absolutely sure that we dare to propose this because this is perhaps uh, in the category of wish list, but it is the general idea that instead of helping people uh, with specialized legislation at different stages in, in life, that you rather would have a, a general right that people will receive a decent salary when they are sick, you know, when they are unemployed, and when they are old. So that is the general guaranteed livable income for everyone. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Jürgen. <clears throat> Thank you.
those, uh, just to repeat what Jürgen said at the beginning, these are summaries of ideas which are explained in the book. And at first glance, they may seem a little strange or a little controversial, but when you read the book, you'll understand why they work. What I want to stress here is that they are feasible. We started from the, from the be beginning of this with the premise that we have failed so far because so many of the solutions proposed by people like us and the Club of Rome are not politically acceptable. And so we have chosen 13 answers to the problems which should benefit the majority of people immediately because most people are motivated by their short-term interests. And so all of these solutions give an immediate benefit to the majority of the population. The 1% may have all the power and all the money, but the 99% should have the democratic right. And so these solutions have a chance of being implemented, and that's why we, we chose them. The minister talked a great deal about what's happening in the developing world. Our book does not cover the developing world except to say that it needs a number of the same policies. But the problems in the developing world are fundamentally different. In the rich world, there is already enough uh, wealth. The problem is one of distribution. If we take the wealth of the rich world and divide it by the population, then everybody can theoretically live well. That's not the same in the poor world. We need a different solution in the poor world. But our solutions do work. A lot of them have already been tried in different countries. Jürgen talked about Iran, but a great many of these solutions have already been tried in Scandinavia and in Germany and in other places. So they actually have a grounding in practicality. Finally, Jürgen and I have spent a great deal of time thinking about this, and we've spoken to a great many of our colleagues in the Club of Rome, and we can see no other solution. We face a time of considerable difficulty. There is no choice but to change. If we carry on down the current path, inequality will worsen, unemployment will worsen, and climate change will worsen. We need to change the system. And we cannot see another way forward. And we look forward to discussing that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Just, uh, it's getting very warm in here, yeah. so just let me ask you one, one question. Your ideas, as you said, are quite radical. They are quite extreme, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people won't like it. <laughs> they won't like them. And I'm not only talking about business leaders, but also politicians, political thinkers. Um, how do you convince critiques? What are you doing? That's, that's, that's a very good question, and, and, and it's a very big problem. We can see by the rise of political extremism in many countries in Europe today, in, in, in Austria or Sweden or Spain or Greece, on the left and the right, that there's a strong political discontent. And one of the barriers that we face is this political failure that exists throughout the Western world. The answer is to offer people a positive solution, a positive way forward, something that appeals to their short-term interests. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make people realize that there is a better way forward, that there is a solution to the problems, that we can improve average living standards if the majority asks for that. The trouble is nobody's asking for it right now, or at least not in the right way. So my answer to the same question is uh, the following. That what I'm currently doing and what you should be doing is to try to explain to the voter that they actually have the power to put these things in place in spite of the fact that this is not in the short-term interest of owners, you know, the, the ten, me and the other 10% of the population that owns most things. So you have to explain this to people, and that's hard work, because these people have been brainwashed by free market thinking, you know, and the hate of big government for so many decades that this is not easily done, but should be done. The second thing you should do, you should follow the advice of Minister Miller. Whenever there is a crisis, there is an opportunity to introduce policy, normally. And the best example I can think of is the great financial crisis where the Republic of Korea, South Korea, used the opportunity to put in place huge stimulus packages, but they were green. 
So instead of paying people for building roads and paying people for establishing national parks, this is what they did in the Great Depression in the United States, they paid people to start making Korea infrastructure greener, more climate efficient, less uh, climate intensive, which is a green stimulus package and which worked, of course, equally well as asking people to do anything else. So that's using a crisis to try to jump uh, policy. Thank you for your remarks. Ich glaube, es gibt sehr viele Fragen aus dem Publikum, zumindest hoffe ich das. Wir öffnen jetzt das Panel. I Wieder think warten Sie bitte auf das Mikro, from the bis das zu Ihnen kommt, damit die Leute am Livestream auch mithören so können. Everyone, listen, everyone listening to us via the Livestream can hear your question as well. Keine Fragen? No questions. <laughs> Um, I would like to know, you said that uh, only uh, women should be celebrated who only get uh, bear one child or less, none that is. Um, I'm surprised by this as why, why is that the case? Because at the moment there is still the theory that obviously in Germany you would need more children to have the possibility uh, to sustain society as it is and to be able to finance the rapidly growing older society. So why would you say is that a case? And additionally, I would say it's very controversial as you obviously um, try to say, tell women what is the better way to live. I'm very glad that you asked this question and prefaced this in the intelligent manner, because you started by saying there is the theory that you need more children in order to sustain an aging population. The point is that that theory is wrong. And this is very hard to explain to people, but it's very simple to explain in principle. When the number of old people increases in a society like Germany or Norway or the United States or anywhere else, the number of children goes down at exactly the same rate. So if you add the total dependency burden in society, namely the sum of the old and the plus the young and divide by the number of people in working age, there is hardly any change over the last 30 years, and there will not be much change over the next 20 years. Uh, look at my 2052 book where this is in great quantitative detail. So point number one is that what needs to do in order to solve the problem of an aging population is simply to take the money that the households save because they have a few children and use this to pay for the old. Or it means in my life that instead of spending my income on three children, I have only one, I'm spending my income on my parents who are now 98, you know, which is, uh, and that's the type of, of change that will occur. Uh, on your second point, that one should let women determine uh, their own future, I solidly agree, but you should not disregard the point that, first of all, women in the rich world are increasingly choosing to have fewer children because they would much rather have a career than having more children. And secondly, most countries, Germany and Norway, has put in place incredible subsidy systems in order to pay women, convince women to have more children, like free kindergartens, etc., 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 that we are exploring. So in our country, we have been able to lift the birth rate from 1.3 children per woman to 1.8 children per woman by paying roughly, uh, what is this, uh, three man years of effort. So this is of the order of uh, 200,000 euros is actually paid for each baby that we produce and who will only get into the labor force, you know, 25 years into the future after it has been to kindergarten for four years, to primary school for seven years, to secondary school for five years and to university for another four years, all paid by the taxpayer. Then finally you get a worker, you know, in to, to who are going to take care of the old. This is a stupid strategy. It's based on a fallacious theory. Excuse me. I, I just want to add that we're also trying to make a very important point here. 
the, the, the subject of population is very rarely addressed because it is such a controversial subject. And yet it is also a fact that with 7.4 billion people on the planet, there are too many of us. And so we need to find some way of encouraging everybody to understand that the population is too large. And of course that can't be changed quickly. It requires us to educate people, particularly women, uh, in the developing world. But we wanted to say, look, the rich world should be making an example. We should be showing the way forward, and this is one way to do it. Hinten war um, yes. Freistadt zuerst. Ja, Sie sind uh, dran. How do you gonna create an international consensus for all of these reforms? Because most of the reforms hurt national interests. For example, restricting trade would hurt Germany. Why would they like uh, reconsider this if it hurts their own interests? And how do you gonna create a vision so um, governments start to think long term because they have to think in election cycles? Uh, I would draw on the experience over the last 40 years, which shows that it is impossible to reach international agreement on important matters. So instead of trying to push for global agreements where everyone agrees, I will start on working on coalitions of the willing. You know, so that, for instance, in the, in the CO2 area, if the EU and China decides you know, to put in place either a high carbon price or other restrictions on carbon emissions. Uh, and uh, that's enough, because they will then put up a border around the trade between China and the EU and say that anyone is welcome to be part of this system, but they must then first introduce the same high cost of carbon on their production. If they do so, they're perfectly willing. So instead, so I repeat, instead of shooting for what has proven impossible, you know, to get to binding agreements with 192 uh, uh, nations, I would start with small coalitions of the willing, the ones that are progressive and willing to go it first. I agree with you that this will have to violate some of the free trade rules, but this will happen anyway. You know, look at Brexit and look at Trump. Again, we're, we're trying to make a point of principle here. From the last 30 years, we've all been brainwashed by this neoliberal capitalist model, which makes us think that growth is good. It makes us think that growth reduces inequality. It makes us think that growth reduces unemployment. And it makes us think wrongly that growth lifts people out of poverty. It does none of those things, as the book explains. The, the idea that a billion people have been lifted from poverty in the last 30 years is nonsense. And it also makes us think that all trade is good. So I just ask you to think about TTIP. Most people in Europe do not want TTIP because it gives so much power to corporations. And what we're saying is we need some pushback. We need to understand that all these ideas have been fundamentally flawed for 30 years and we need some new ideas. Here too. Bitte schön. Yeah, let me be a little bit provocative to my colleagues from the Club of Rome, um, because I, I think you're going to get a lot of provocative <laughs> responses to this. Um, what I would like to ask you, and you've just um, actually opened an entry point to that, uh, if we re remember Donella Meadows, who is co-author of the, the Limits to Growth, then she would have said on her list of 12 leverage points, she would have said, oh, you know, you're operating on the leverage, on, on the level of measures. But measures cannot really, um, you know, create the change that we want to see. And so my question to you is, uh, where do these measures, the recommendations, link to a, a really profound paradigm shift that you've just started to address? Thank you for that answer, question, which is also a good question, which has a totally trivial answer. Donella, I, and roughly... 10,000 other global think thought leaders have spent the last 40 years trying to engineer uh, an attitude change, a value change in society, away from a fossil-based consumerism type of ambition towards something described very nicely by, by the minister, you know, and by the Nella Meadows, you know, a, a soft, uh, uh, harmonious uh, coexistence with nature and uh, other fellow beings. 
we have failed. You know, we are now uh, 40 years down the line, and the number of people who voluntarily, you know, join movements for this type of thing is illustrated by the low attendance of the Green Party in your country and by the Green Party in my country. I live in a country which is even richer than yours. It's totally homogeneous. We have had free education from kindergarten to the PhD level for two generations. We have free health, we have, you know, everything in Norway is the way that Americans and others dream about. When we then have a vote, you know, do you believe in fossil-based economic growth, consumerism, or do you believe in then Donella Meadows and friends about a more harmonious future? In our country, 3.7% vote in favor of the ideal, and 96% of the population thinks that we should continue as is, we should not pay more taxes in order to solve the climate problem, etc., etc. And the reasons are, of course, described in our book. And we are then, instead of, for the umpteen time, presenting a new ideal dream based on a value change that is not going to come, you know, we are doing the other way around. We go directly at the measures and try to get the measures in place in the hope that this might change values in the end. It is the same as convincing a person to buy an electric car after he has had his Mercedes for the last 40 years. You know, to try to do it from a value point of view is very hard. But if you get that person into a Tesla, you know, a modern electric car, you know, the guy will discover that this is great fun. And then, listen to him in the next cocktail party, he's then arguing in favor of electric cars. So we are choosing the bottom up rather than the ideology down because of the sad experience over the last 40 years. But thank you for the good question. There's another question. Let's be... John? Yeah, okay. Um, I have a follow-up question on the um, one child um, support a solution you've uh, suggested and um, you said it that the problem or the growing population is not really a European or a Western world problem but rather um, developing world problem and you said we should set an example but wouldn't it be a wise idea to start it at the same time in those countries and not set the example in this area and then maybe in 20, 25 years in the developing world and the second um, part of this question China um, used to have a one-child policy. Did that work? Okay, so uh, thank you for good uh, questions. My daughter is the most dangerous animal on the surface of the earth. Her consumption is 30 times that of a poor little girl in India. It's much, much, much more important to reduce population growth rates and get the number of babies down in the rich world than it is in the poor world. And the, and the factor is actually 30. So my daughter, stinking rich, well-educated, young, you know, is really what is the problem. So that's the reason why deliberately we start this process in the rich world. In the poor world, fertility rates are falling impressively for the right reasons, namely because we are educating people, because the health sector is making progress, and because contraception is increasingly available. And so luckily we are seeing very rapid decline in population growth rates in the most surprising places on the surface of the earth. What about China? China, Premier Deng introduced the one-child family policy in 1981. This is now, uh, what is this, 35 years ago. Uh, and as a consequence, there are now 400 million fewer Chinese than there would have been. And it is currently realistic for China to increase the living standards of their 1.3 billion to European standards during the next 40 years. I'm serving as an advisor to the Chinese government, or the Politburo, or the State Council, is what you call it. And the plans are being made, and this is doable, and it would not have been possible if one had had a population of 1.7 billion, which one does luckily not have. 
you are right that just recently they re further relaxed the legislation. This they do because Chinese women do not want children, because it is terribly expensive to have children uh, in, in, in uh, China. In Shanghai, where I've also helped making their 50-year plan, the average family size is 0 0.6 children per woman during her reproductive age. And they think that the legislation will increase this from 0 0.6 to 0 0.62. Hier drüben war noch eine Frage. Following up on my question on the root causes, your colleague Ian Dunlop, he was with us here in Berlin with all the Nobel Peace Laureates. He's not only saying we need a new science, but we followed up, we need a new language, new way of presenting, communicating, even voting, to really go to the deep drivers. And my question in the beginning uh, focused on, on the deep root causes of the predicament of mankind to really see, and Club of Rome with uh, Volkswagen Foundation last year in Herrenhausen, we were trying to think beyond all this to really come to ways of presenting and thinking in different ways. So I think we are, since 40 years, maybe on, on the wrong track. Yeah. This is a very, very important area. And, and we spent um, much of the weekend in, in a castle in southern Austria um, discussing with a, a group of young activists how to change the system. And of course, this whole issue about where did this begin, and it goes all the way back before the Enlightenment and, and perhaps before the Renaissance, about how our thinking about nature and about the world really began. But we've also recognized, I think Jürgen and I are working on this, that we've been talking about this for, for more than 40 years actively. We've been trying to suggest long-term solutions about changing the paradigm, about changing the narrative. And as Jürgen says, we haven't had nearly enough impact. And so when we started this book, we said, what makes people change their behavior? And what makes them change their behavior is a short-term incentive something that gives them an immediate reward. Because we don't have time to change the way they think. We don't have time to change the narrative. If we want to avoid the two degrees, we have to make changes now. We have about 20 years. So uh, we have to offer ideas which will help shift the economic system in ways that most people will accept without changing their entire worldview. And that's what we're trying to do here. Ein eindringlicher Appell jetzt am Schluss. Gibt es noch weitere Fragen? Das ist nicht der Fall. Dann vielen Dank fürs Kommen. Vielen Dank, dass Sie so lange ausgehalten haben. Beide Autoren sind noch eine ganze Weile da. Sie Sie ansprechen, um und diese Autoren werden hier sein, wenn sie Interviews stehen, wie Sie vorhin sagen. Nach dem offiziellen Event und wir sind glücklich, in Diskussionen mit Ihnen auf bilateralem Ebene zu sein. Vielen Dank.